Hi, football fans. For some of you fans, this is the week you've been waiting for all season. This is the week in which traditional state rivals meet on the gridiron in six southeastern states. It's the chance for some fans to get even with that neighbor next door or that guy that has been bugging him on the job for the last year because good old Gizmo U upset his team last season. Yep, as the saying goes, you can throw out the record books when these teams meet. The coaches have no trouble getting their boys up because this is the one that counts the most, the one they must live with for another year or perhaps a lifetime for the senior players involved. Here's the lineup of games for this week. Two games were played on Thanksgiving, Ole Miss and Mississippi State, and that nationally televised night game from Tampa between Florida State and Houston. In Saturday contest, Alabama and Auburn collide in Birmingham, Georgia Tech and Georgia vie in Athens, Florida host Miami and Gainesville, Tennessee meets Vanderbilt in Nashville, and in a night game, LSU plays Tulane in New Orleans. Also on the schedule involving Southeastern teams, Cincinnati at Memphis State, Trinity at Southern Mississippi, and Louisville at Wichita. The postseason bowl lineups are almost complete, and as usual, the Southeastern area of the country is well represented. Five teams from our section have already accepted bids, and at least three more are possibilities. At the time this show is being recorded, the bowls are practically full, with the exception of the Peach and Atlanta, and the Liberty and Memphis, and by the time you hear this, they may have also signed up their teams. There are at least two bowls that won't have a Southeastern team involved. That's the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, where the Pacific 8 and Big 10 have had a pact for low these many years, and where Stanford will play Ohio State on January 1st, and the Cotton Bowl in Dallas, where it will be Notre Dame versus the winner of the Texas-Arkansas game. But elsewhere, Southeastern teams are much in vogue. Two of them, Ole Miss and Auburn, are in the Gator Bowl at Jacksonville. Tennessee takes on the Air Force in the Sugar Bowl at New Orleans. Alabama meets Oklahoma in the Astro Blue Bonnet Bowl in Houston. And Georgia Tech faces Texas Tech in the Sun Bowl at El Paso. Since Notre Dame turned down an Orange Bowl bid to play in the Cotton Bowl, LSU, which was shunned last year despite a 9-1 record, may get the call against Nebraska. The Florida Gators, the Florida State Seminoles, and the Georgia Bulldogs are still possibilities for the bowl games and may have signed up at the time you hear this. The Seminoles thrashed Kansas State 33-7 Saturday in Tallahassee for their fifth straight victory. Coach Bill Peterson's Florida State Club has apparently jailed to the point that they are a different football team than the one that opened the season. You heard Coach Bill Peterson say on last week's program that he gives a lot of credit to the offensive line. Credit also must be given to senior quarterback back Tommy Warren, who hung in there when the going was rough. He lost his job in early season and then came back not only to take the starting signal calling post back, but to turn in some outstanding performances. Barefooted kicker Frankie Fontes, who had already set a field goal record, has scored 61 points through the Kansas State game, a single season scoring record for FSU kickers. The Florida Gators, after a week of rest, are playing the Miami Hurricanes at Florida Field in Gainesville, and the Gators are heavy favorites to win their eighth game of the year against only three losses. That is a good record and one that many teams would like to have, but the trouble is, in the three losses, Florida got walloped. The defeats at the hands of Alabama, Tennessee, and Auburn were all by lopsided margins. This is Doug Dickey's first year as head gator, and he's had his problems, but most people, realizing that Doug is coaching players he inherited from athletic director Ray Graves, figure that he'll be right up among the leaders in the years to come. Quarterback John Reeves, though having his troubles at times, has been the Southeastern Conference passing leader again and among the leaders in the nation. Carlos Alvarez, though not at full speed because of that knee trouble, still has been a valuable player for this season's Florida team. Certainly Florida has an explosive offense that is worthy of bowl consideration. Georgia Tech and Georgia both took last week off and are raring to go in their big game in Athens. Two weeks ago, you would have thought that Tech, having a good year, would be the heavy favorite. But now, since Georgia pulled that upset of mighty Auburn, the Bulldogs are in a position to make it a winning season and possibly get a bid to a bowl, most likely the Peach and Atlanta, in which Georgia would be a big draw as the host team. The Bulldogs have found that senior reserve Paul Gilbert is a winner at quarterback and that sophomore Ricky Lake can really grind out the yardage on the ground. Georgia Tech has already accepted a bid to play Texas Tech in the Sun Bowl, but before doing so, would like to duplicate last year's victory over Georgia and boost the season record to 8-3, and three, the best since Bud Carson took over from athletic director Bobby Dodd as head coach in 67. 
The engineer's attack is paced by the running of Brent Cunningham and the quarterbacking of Eddie Machan and Jack Williams. Defensively, tackle Rock Perdoni has been great, and so have a number of secondary men like Bubba Holtz, Jeff Ford, and little Mike Wysong, who has been outstanding in returning kicks. The battle of two Tennessee teams is at Nashville, where Vanderbilt plays host to Tennessee. Both are coming in the game off victories, Tennessee a 45 to nothing romp over Kentucky, and Vandy a squeaky 36 to 28 win over previously undefeated small college power Tampa. Tennessee rolled up its biggest score in 32 years against the hapless Kentucky Wildcats before a homecoming crowd of over 63,000 in Knoxville. After this week, Tennessee still has another game with UCLA before moving on to the Sugar Bowl and that New Year's date with the Air Force. LSU, which plays a night game against state rival Tulane, is only five points away from an unbeaten season. The Bayou Bengals lost by two points to Texas A&M in the last few seconds of their season opener, and this past Saturday at South Bend, Indiana, were defeated by mighty Notre Dame on a field goal with 2.54 left in the game. The LSU defense, especially against rushing, is fabulous. The Tigers have not allowed a touchdown by rushing in their last 12 games, extending back to last season. Next week, LSU will be meeting Ole Miss in a game that will decide the SEC championship. But I'm sure Coach Charlie McClendon won't let his boys look too far ahead because their opponent this week, Tulane, is not a pushover for anyone. The Green Wave has a fine 7-3 record this season after walloping North Carolina State 31 to nothing on a fine performance by tailback David Abercrombie. Memphis State has already lost two Missouri Valley Conference games, and the Tigers will not win the title for the first time since they entered the conference, so their game with Cincinnati doesn't mean much, except the Tigers would like to close out the season on a winning note. Ditto for Southern Mississippi. The Southerners went into a tailspin after their colossal upset of Ole Miss and haven't won a game since. They'll try to take it all out on Trinity this week. My guest this week on Southeastern Football is Ole Miss coach Frank Bruiser Kennard. Coach Kennard, uh, everyone I'm sure is wondering about the status of Archie Manning. Is he going to be able to play against LSU? Uh, at this moment, uh, we're hopeful that Archie will be able to play against LSU. Uh, we have no uh, concrete evidence that he won't. Now, uh, this coming Tuesday, his doctor will remove the present cast. This will be the second removal. And replace this one with a lighter cast and then determine course how soon Archie will be with us. Right. Well, you've done uh, well since taking over for Coach Vaught after he was uh, stricken. This must uh, must have put quite a bit of pressure on you having to step in like that. Well, thank you. You're nice to say that, but uh, I don't look at it as a pressure thing. And uh, the team has uh, played well, and uh, we've been fortunate to win two or three games since he left. Well, you've been associated with a lot of Ole Miss teams. Uh, how do you compare uh, this uh, team? Is this one of the greatest the Rebels have had? This team uh, certainly is one of the greatest the Rebels have ever had. And uh, as you know, and uh, everybody in the Southeast knows that we have had some great teams. And we consider this uh, one of the better teams yet. We've heard a lot of uh, adjectives about Archie. Uh, what is your description of Manning? Uh, my description of uh, Manning uh, adjectives uh, will not fit him because uh, you run out of adjectives and he's still greater than anything you can say about him. Well, uh, Coach uh, Vaught, uh, I understand, is uh, hopeful of um, getting back uh, to the job. Uh, how soon do you think this will be? Well, I have no uh, assurance of when he will be back with us, but we certainly are all hopeful that he can return real soon. Uh, I visited with Coach Vaught a few minutes yesterday morning and uh, of course, he didn't say when he would be back, and I didn't ask him, of course. And certainly, we're all hopeful that it'll be real soon. Coach Kennard, what are your thoughts about this uh, Ole Miss-LSU game? Well, my thoughts about Ole Miss-LSU game at the moment are really blank on the board because mm -hmm. we have a Thanksgiving engagement with Mississippi State. <laughs> Uh, Coach uh, Kennard, thanks very much. Uh, congratulations to you and the Rebels on accepting that Gator Bowl invitation. Thank you so much, and I appreciate you calling. Ole Miss interim coach Frank Bruiser Kennard. I'll be back for a crystal ball look at Alabama-Auburn in just a minute. <laughs> 
The Crystal Bowl has another toughie this week, the Alabama-Auburn game, or perhaps since the Tigers won last year, War Eagle fans would prefer that I say Auburn-Alabama game. A few weeks ago, Auburn looked like the heavy favorite to win the state championship, but Alabama has shown marked improvement, while Georgia proved that Auburn is not invincible. The Tigers sorely missed injured linebacker Bobby Strickland, and Georgia ground out the yardage. This is something Alabama does real well with the SEC's leading rusher, Johnny Musso and Dave Brungard, and no doubt the Bear will have that in his game plan. That is not to say that Bama won't utilize the passing arm of Scott Hunter and Neb Hayden because the tight air game can be very effective with receivers like David Bailey and others. But Auburn, I think, was not mentally ready for Georgia. They will be for Alabama. If the Tigers can develop a ground game with Mickey Zofko and Wallace Clark to make the passing game effective, the Pat Sullivan to Terry Beasley combination is terrific. The crystal ball says that Auburn will take an 8-2 record into bowl play and that Alabama will be 6-5 and five after the Tigers beat the Crimson Tide in Birmingham. This is Earl Hutto and that's Southeastern football for this week.